Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. Hi there. Hi there. We have coffee again. We do, because we're recording on uh, day two of our Truckee excursion, and it's early-ish, 9.30-ish. 9.30 is early to have to talk. It is. It is. Although, Although we usually do this at 7, 7 a.m. <laughs> well, we don't usually do this, we don't do this at 7, 7 a.m. a.m. You're talking at 7 a.m. Yeah. And I'm singing at 7 a.m. And, and, and that is different. It is. So, yes. So, we are doing the Truckee Sessions. And we have coffee in front of us. And I want to just assure everyone that it is just coffee. It's just coffee right now. Because there's... I. I can't drink at 9.30 in the Mm -hmm. morning. I I don't know how people do that. Anyway, so what are we talking about today, my friend? Are we talking about the problem that I raised to you? (laughs) Uh, Well, we've we've kind of had an ongoing conversation about what we've sort of dubbed the lordship of Jesus. And that's kind of a big idea. Growing up in in the church background that I did, Jesus' name was often preceded by the title of Lord, Lord Jesus, or Jesus, Lord and Savior, or Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. And Lord is a, is, a, is a pretty loaded title. I don't know all the history of the word, but I know that in serfdom, Lord was kind of a tyrant and basically could demand anything of anyone, anytime, within the realm that the Lord oversaw or owned or whatever. So to think of Jesus as Lord presents some interesting questions, if not problems. So we've had this conversation going for a while about how do you reconcile the lowly suffering Jesus with the Lord Jesus? How do those things mesh? How do they coexist? When we pray to Jesus, who are we praying to? Is Jesus telling us to do things or demanding things of us the way that a Lord would? What does it mean to give lordship to someone? Is that something you can give to someone or does a Lord take it? I mean, what? Ooh, how does that? I hadn't thought about that one. How does that whole thing work? Yeah, I want to add to that kind of coming from the other direction theologically. If we understand Jesus of Nazareth to be human. Mm-hmm. And we refer to the divine aspect as Christ. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to say that Jesus is Lord? Because one presumes that Jesus' resurrected body and resurrected person were different than Jesus pre-crucifixion. If for no other reason than people didn't always recognize him. Right. Right? So something was different. And... Once we kind of get into the theology of this stuff and that his material person cannot be eternal by definition, right? what does it even mean to say Jesus is Lord? Mm-hmm. Like the dead guy, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not being facetious about mm-hmm. this, right? Yeah. The, the dead human being is Lord. And if Jesus is somehow the historical figure mm-hmm. was somehow also the non-physical, ahistorical, risen Christ, well, that just raises a whole bunch of interesting theological questions mm-hmm. in and of itself, mm-hmm. aside from who am I calling Lord and what does Lord even mean? What does Lord even mean? Right? And the and the difference between Lord and Savior is dramatic. Yes. I mean, really hugely dramatic. Lords in general. Do not save us. Right. In general, lords are in charge of us. Yeah. You know, and, and so those have two different, completely different ideas about them. And I, I, personally, I don't have trouble with those two together mm-hmm. because they're naming different aspects, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like that's fine. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what I would mean by either of them in a particular way. But I am, I am really struggling with the... With the, what does it mean to say Jesus is Lord or Christ is Lord? Like, so, you know, I come out of this progressive, you know, background where 
Jesus was a really, really nice guy and smart teacher. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't pray to Jesus. Why would you? That doesn't make any sense. Uh -huh. And Christ is sort of an abstract entity, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, some time ago, I really inserted myself into evangelical land mm -hmm. to try and kind of reclaim Jesus, right. reclaim the power right. of, of this whole story of which we're a part. Right. So I kind of did this from the progressive side and then kind of did this. Now that I'm kind of back into a progressive world, I I'm not sure what to do with that. And, and when we sing songs where Jesus is Lord, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing some kind of, <laughs> you know, there's mm -hmm. this plate spinning thing going mm -hmm. on in my head, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how do I say that and say that? And how do I also worship at the same time? You know? yeah. And what does it mean to worship Jesus? Can we, does that even make sense? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's where I am in this. Any initial thoughts uh, besides the conundrum itself? <laughs> that is a lot to kind of parse. Even just the language of it is a lot to parse. My understanding as a kid growing up in a fundamentalist church was that when you say Jesus is Lord or you make Jesus Lord of your life, you're ceding control, you're offering obedience. But I think as I've grown older, my understanding of Jesus and even really the power of who Jesus is to me is found in Jesus's humility and humanity. So that is not a figure who would demand anything. Right. Of There's me. You're right. There's no demanding. The, the, the power of Jesus is in <laughs> the life that Jesus led that I am inspired to follow. Okay. Uh, I'm inspired to follow Jesus and learn to live as Jesus lived. And the more I become like Jesus by adopting Jesus's mindset, behaviors, you know, the way Jesus loved people and served people, then I become more and more righteous, holy, et cetera, mm -hmm. more like Jesus. To me, that's the power in who Jesus is. Now, we talked a little yesterday about the language of King Jesus. Right. Uh, because some churches do identify Jesus more as King. Mm -hmm. I can relate to the idea of King Jesus because Jesus was mocked as King of the Jews. See, I love that. When you said that yesterday, I was like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, sorry. I, <laughs> I, I can relate to, to Jesus as King. I have no problem elevating Jesus to King. And going back to one of the episodes that we recorded yesterday where we were talking about kingship and who do we give that kind of authority to. Right. I, I would willingly give that kind of authority to Jesus. Because Jesus has proven to be loving and kind and just and, all, and humble and all the things that I aspire to be. And everything that I would look for in a leader mm -hmm. and a king. Jesus embodies all of that for me. That's kind of what I do with Jesus these days. <laughs> um, that's where I put Jesus. Right. There are times that I pray to Jesus. And generally, if I'm praying to Jesus, it's because I need to know that Jesus experienced what I did. So if I am grieving, okay. if I'm sorrowful, if I'm angry, if I'm if I'm like mired in human emotion, like things that I'm trying to sort, many times I will pray to Jesus because I think Jesus understands things. Jesus understands. Now, what to do with Jesus and Jesus Christ, the idea of Jesus Christ. And I and I believe that Jesus and the Christ are versions of the same. I I tend to think of when Jesus and I know some of this reference is, is kind of like, I don't know if I've heard this in a Southern Gospel song or somewhere, but the idea that when Jesus came to earth, whether it was God dispatching Jesus to earth, whether Jesus decided to come to earth, however that happened, that Jesus you know, stood up from his throne next to the God the Father and he took off his royal robe and he willingly took off some of his Christness to become one of us. I have a hard time. Well, I don't believe that Jesus uh, was God in a trench coat and a hat and dark glasses. <laughs> I don't think he was like infiltrating us. Uh, I think he became us. Um, White fan. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think he really became us. But to become us, he had to become less God. Absolutely. To be more us. If for, if for nothing else, then... 
and eternal and material are uh, in conflict, if not contradictory. Right. 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 So that's kind of, and then the, the risen Christ would be what happened after Jesus then was able to take off his humanity and again become fully Christ. That's kind of the way in my brain I sort all that. Uh, and I also am very willing to say there is so much about all of this that I don't know and won't know. I have become comfortable with not knowing exactly what happened on the cross, not knowing exactly what happened for the three days that Jesus wasn't breathing, uh, not knowing exactly what happened when Jesus started appearing to people and right. talking to people and interacting with people and people are touching his hands. And I, I don't know what to do with all of that. I believe that it all happened. I don't understand how, and I don't right. feel the need, the need to understand how. Right. So interestingly, in Scripture, no one, no one touches Jesus' hands. He offers them, but nobody touches them. The material pieces of the risen Christ are when he lifts up bread and breaks bread, so he's able mm -hmm. to grab, mm -hmm. right, or something, and when he's eating fish, Right. Right. So those are kind of the the why we think material. Right? right. And and I have no problem with the idea that God could present God's self as human and be doing everything through the whole mm -hmm. totality of God's abilities. Mm -hmm. So I have no trouble with the idea that God could present God's self as risen Jesus and break bread not through having materiality, mm -hmm. but through manifesting materiality for the moment. For the moment, you know what I mean? sure. Right. So I have no problem. Like, that kind of stuff, I'm with you. I, I, I don't have to know exactly. I, And I'm when I look at the various theories of atonement, I can see historically wh where they came from mm -hmm. and why they're important to each group. And the problem is when you kind of read across groups, it doesn't work. So I don't I agree with you. I don't have any problem with that stuff. I think no, I know. So I have I have at various times practiced praying to Jesus, but it's a very uncomfortable thing mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. It feels very unnatural. And I think it's because the humanity of Jesus has always been clear to me. That's always yeah. been the part on which I could hang my hat yeah. was the humanity of Jesus. And so praying to a human is always a little twitchy for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I have trouble with the eternal Jesus, except in kind of an abstract way, right? So the, the human being, Jesus, physically is not eternal. So I've got to do something. And here's where I'm getting stuck. And, I, and I'm, I'm really listening to you about the idea of King Jesus, particularly juxtaposed to any human, any any uh, mm -hmm. standard king, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That if he's mocked as king of the Jews, and if we've got presidents who are trying to be kings, and we've mm -hmm. got God not wanting kings but wanting to be king, like that, mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Mm -hmm. the The language that I've taken on, which is not in much music, Lord is nice, right? Because Lord is short; it's mm -hmm. one syllable. I've, I've really taken on master, and not master mm -hmm. in the sense of master-slave, but master in the sense of master and apprentice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that Jesus is more than just a teacher. Jesus is somebody I try to follow very closely and pay attention to mm -hmm. so that I can become like him. Right? Yeah. And, and that language really works for me. Because it doesn't require that Jesus is physically here now. It does require some imagination on my part. But it's easy for me to do that with the accounts that we have. To say, okay, this is somebody who understood God and understood living far better than I ever will. And clearly had practices and relationships and ways of being in the world that are mimicable. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who's done it any better. Right. I'm taking him as my master in this, mm -hmm. right?
think I need to find a way to allow Jesus and Christ to meld into a single eternal being in my head. And there's so many problems <laughs> with that intellectually that I have really real trouble getting past. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether some of our listeners, if they came kind of from my direction or they have very literal minds or whatever, have the same problem. Yeah. You know, they get to it and go, well, wait, what? <laughs> right. You know, and even just how do you talk about Jesus? Jesus is, is, what does is mean in this context? Mm -hmm. Jesus was, well, what, well, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think I'm just I'm just really caught up with this. I want to I want to play with the what you had said or so you talked about the kingship being something you could definitely take on. Mm -hmm. And lord being such a weird word because mm -hmm. Jesus absolutely does not demand fealty. Yeah. Jesus invites fealty. Mm -hmm. And invites a relationship of not equality with him but definitely inter interactivity with him in a way that you don't have with the, with the Lord. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So I can, I can, I can mess with that. I don't know what to do when I get to the singing part. Well, you know, when I sing, like I'm thinking about, I know one song that, that I do a lot because I think there's a lot in it that speaks to me and speaks to our folks is Lord, I need you. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't think you would go to a, a person who behave the way that lords behaved and say, Lord, I need you. Right. So I'm not thinking of that kind of figure when I say that. Right. I'm picturing Jesus. I mean, I'm picturing a very loving, arms open, inviting us to come mm -hmm. kind of figure. It kind of requires me to redefine what I'm saying when I say, Lord, I need you. Okay. I think that in most evangelical churches, they don't, people don't, necessarily understand what they're saying when they say Lord, mm -hmm. like they don't parse it to the degree that we're doing right now. And, and so people conjure up different versions of Jesus based on their upbringing, their background, their father and everything else that, right. that they, you know, so, I mean, some people probably don't see Jesus as humble and kind as much as they see Jesus as needing our obedience, even though there's right. really not support for that. In anything that we read in right. the Gospels, right? But simply, that's their idea of God, and Jesus is their idea of God, and so all that gets conflated. But for me, I guess when I'm saying, "Lord, I need you," it's more than a term of endearment, like an honorific, what? like an honorific. It is, it like is. It's something you are bestowing on Him in your relationship to Him. Yes, rather than an idea that He necessarily embodies, like must embody. Right. Him. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. I don't have trouble with Lord all by itself because of the God is so big. Yes. That, sure, Yeah. <laughs> I have no <laughs> trouble calling God Lord. Giving God the due respect. Yes. Right? Where I really get stuck is things like Jesus' name, name above all names, mm. that kind of stuff. Like Jesus Messiah I have enjoyed singing that from the singing point of view. Theologically, it makes me nuts mm. because I can do the Jesus Messiah because Messiah is about, you know, the one who rescues. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. I, I don't even know what that means. I know what it's supposed to mean, but I don't know what it means. And so when I sing it, I have the... Am I putting that name above all names? And why would the name matter? And I understand mm -hmm. it's about the power of naming, yes. right? Yes. The power of naming. But because I I don't have a an attachment, and I don't mean that in a bad way, I don't have an attachment to praying through the name of Jesus, and it should be through, not in, by the way, mm -hmm. because I don't do that. It's not part of my tradition. It wouldn't, it's not normal for right. me. Right. When we sing that, I'm just like, oh. <laughs> yeah you know you know it's that kind of thing where i really just i i don't know what to do and here's the thing i have no trouble with king jesus will roll your burdens away mm -hmm. i have no trouble with that mm -hmm. but name above all names the rescue for sinners mm -hmm. the ransom from heaven mm -hmm. it just ah oh, <laughs> makes me twitch yeah 
And I don't want it to make me twitch. I mean, I yeah. want to have a rich enough, layered enough concept and relationship with God that none of it makes me twitch. It makes right. me curious. Right. It makes me think about it, but doesn't make me go, ugh. Right. You know? Right. Well, those phrases you just named from that song, they really do kind of point to a very specific atonement idea. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you know, there, there are multiple atonement ideas, and many of them have become a soup. Uh, because we adopt pieces of, you know. So you're right. If that version of atonement, this addresses what happened on the cross, right? And this mm -hmm. is one of those things that I'm okay with it being mystery. Yeah. I believe in the outcome. Yeah. Exactly what happened and how it went down and how God chose to do that is <laughs> above my pay grade. <laughs> um, well, definitely, given, <laughs> given what we do for a living. Right. <laughs> So yeah, I get I get where that could could be twitchy, especially because you are such a deep thinker and you really do pay attention to the details of how these things play together or don't. I think most Christians don't, frankly. I think they accept the pieces and then maybe at some point in their life they're confronted with two things that don't fit. Because we work with people like that all the time. Mm -hmm. People who confront ideas about God that no longer fit mm -hmm. their paradigm. They run into so the wall. How do you how do you turn that Rubik's Cube? So sometimes those things, you outgrow them or they don't fit anymore. They don't work for you anymore, which goes back to 17 Embraceable Ideas, which our listeners should check out. I get twisted up on singing about the blood right now because number one, it's graphic and painful to think about. I understand that I sometimes need to reflect on what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. and I need to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made. Do I want to sing about the sacrifice Jesus made every Sunday? No, I don't. Uh, there are other aspects of Jesus and other aspects of God the Father that I want to pay attention to. I don't think that my the value of my faith is wrapped up in what Jesus did on the cross. Right. right. For some churches, it's all about the blood. It's all about the cross. It's all about I was a terrible sinner and Jesus saved me. Right. And I grew up in something kind of like that. Yeah. But what we know about God, what we know about Jesus, and our faith is built on something so much bigger, so much richer, so much more nuanced than that. There's so much more that I don't want to spend a disproportionate amount of time on the blood of the cross. Mm -hmm. I want to spend the season of Lent thinking about Jesus' suffering, relating to Jesus' suffering. Yep. I want to take Holy Week and I want to immerse myself in the passion. And I want to think about everything that Jesus went through. I want to go through the stations of the cross. And then on Easter, I want to celebrate whatever amazing, mysterious, wonderful thing happened. Right. And then I want to go back to looking at everything else right. plus that, but everything right. else. So, so yeah, the theology of some of these songs is very specific to mm -hmm. that. And some churches sing that every week. Some people want to be reminded of that all the time, constantly right. be reminded of that all the time. Right. I, I prefer to make that a smaller part of my entire faith life. And I prefer not to get too hung up on the details of what mysterious things happen. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's how I get through singing some of those. Mm -hmm. uh, the church that I serve, they're <laughs> lovely folks, and but they're Baptist. And so part of that Baptist hymnody is... You know, Fanny Crosby and it's songs that are about the blood and it's the cross and and so I and they want to sing those songs mm -hmm. and so I'm constantly putting those into the mix even though that's not what I would tend toward myself and that's mm -hmm. not what we tend toward in our worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things came up as you were talking. The 
blood language doesn't tend to bother me because I grip its historicity mm-hmm. so much. Really understand the well. I take that back. The blood of the lamb is Jewish imagery. Right. Right. No problem with that right. at all. Sure. Right. Totally understand. I get that. How too. that that one's fine. No problem with that. Being washed in the blood is a fascinating pagan image. Mm. Just fascinating. And so in some ways I have no trouble with that because I just look at it and go, wow, mm-hmm. how did that get in here? <laughs> you know what I <laughs> right. mean? I mean, how did we come to that? Yeah. There's some wonderful uh, writings by 19th century mystics, 19th mm-hmm. century mystics, who talk about that. And that's mm-hmm. fascinating all in itself. Yeah. What, what I started thinking about was, A, how important the liturgical year is. How yes. important it is to follow the rhythms of Jesus' life in a particular way so that Jesus doesn't just become blood pouring out of a guy, Mm -hmm. you know, executed, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I think, the problem with focusing on that all the time is he just becomes a guy who was nailed to a cross. I mean, that's it. Mm -hmm. Golly, I hope there's more to him than just that because there have been a lot of executed people. And if that's it... There have been tons of martyrs. And a lot since him. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I want there to be more. There has to be more. Right. There's, there's nothing there if, right. if, if Jesus didn't do all the other things. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I don't care if that is God on the cross. There's still more to this mm-hmm. yes. than simply that. Yes. Okay. Right. So there's that. The other piece I was thinking about is... When I've talked to agnostics or I've talked to non-Christians about Christianity, then they get stuck on the worship of a man, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know how to respond to that sometimes. Except, here's what I've come to. And this is, this is the way I am able to put it all together. Okay. So, I believe, and I believe that God is present among us, around us, and in us. Yes. That God is in us. Right. I honestly don't care whether it's the Holy Spirit coming at the time you're baptized or the time you breathe. or the, I don't care about that. It's it's mm-hmm. not relevant to me in most, most mm-hmm. of the time. But I believe that God is in us as well as around us. Mm-hmm. And as long as we carry divinity within us, mm-hmm. I can worship the divinity of that man. I have no problem with that. So I don't need Jesus to be God in a cloak of skin Mm -hmm. for me to worship the divinity in him, for me to recognize the divinity in him, for me to aspire to the fullness of divinity that he had. Right, right. Because I do. I do too. So then it isn't that I'm worshiping the guy who peed standing up, right? Mm -hmm. I'm worshiping the divinity in him. Which might mean that I would worship the divinity in you, even though I'm not worshiping you, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would not call you my Lord. Mm -hmm. But I can absolutely honor and worship the divinity that is contained within who you are, that God has given to you. And, you know, when people say seeing the Christ in somebody, well, that's what we're talking about. We're we're talking talking about about. Mm -hmm. noticing that there is a divine spark, a divine spirit Mm -hmm in human beings that is worthy of worship. Not because the human being is, not because we're doing all the right things, but because God inhabits us so fully and so richly that that is worth my awe. That Mm -hmm. is worth my Mm -hmm. paying attention to. That is Mm -hmm. worth my honoring, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's how, when I need to explain it to people who come from a more limited view of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's how I can do that. Oh yeah, sure. Right. Right. So, so that's kind of how I have to come at this from a progressive end is okay. It's not that, well, I think it is. (laughs) Let me, let me frame this. I started to frame it as it's not that Jesus was so special. I do think Jesus is special. Mm -hmm. And I think that Jesus is special in a lot of ways that I don't understand. I also think he's special in ways that I completely understand. When I read the accounts of him, he's teachable, which most of us are not. He's humble, Mm -hmm. which most of us are not. He's confident, which Mm -hmm. most of us are not. Mm -hmm. All these things all at once, plus tenderness, plus 
healing power, which yes. I believe is the power of God inside him. Right. All of those, all of those things. And for those reasons, I can look and say, look, there may be somebody else. There may be many somebody else's who mm -hmm. are just as good as Jesus. I don't know them. This one I know. Mm -hmm. This one mm -hmm. I can I can aspire to be like. I can follow around. I can sing about. Right. That one I can do that because I can see all those things. Right. Right. So that's where the master language mm -hmm. works for me. That's where the Lord language works for me because I choose his lordship. I choose that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit have influence on my life. And that, mm -hmm. I, that I choose to allow them influence on my life. Not just that they couldn't have influence if I didn't allow it, but I'm choosing to allow it, right? Yeah. And the thing about earthly lords or earthly presidents who cast themselves as kings or any of those things is there's an element of us not choosing it. Yeah. There's right. an element that that is we can, well, before before the plague, we could, you know, we could emigrate. Mm-hmm. But there's still going to be another one of those. It's not like getting away from 45 means that you get away from tyrants, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But going back to what you said, the choosing of Jesus, the choosing of God, this is somebody who's worthy of being the Lord. Yes. Worthy of being the king. Yes. And in that way, I have no trouble with the language. Yes. A lot of what you're saying is, is something that's important to remember, I think, as Christians, is that we we engage our minds and we choose. A life of faith is not one conversion experience and then you're done. A life of faith is continuing to choose to be loving, to be kind, to be like Jesus. And I also think that a rich Christian life requires that we engage our imaginations, mm -hmm. requires us to think, well, what did Jesus feel? Mm -hmm. What did Jesus experience? A lot of what we do during Lent is that. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is, what was Jesus thinking in, in the garden? How was Jesus feeling? So I think that to live a rich Christian life, we really do have to not accept things at face value. And I think it's quite okay to engage our minds and our imaginations so that we can put Jesus in a place that makes sense for yeah. us. Yeah. I don't think there is one very narrow way to define who Jesus was and is that God will accept from us. Okay. The, so God's not picky about the particular any particular image we have. I'll speak for myself. Seeing Jesus as fully human is where Jesus' power lies for me. Mm -hmm. I can't become like a deified creature. I can become like a humble, loving, kind, confident servant leader. Right. I can aspire to be that. And I believe that's that's the point. Right. If I'm going to become more holy, righteous, loving, kind, generous, all those things, Jesus is the example yes. that I can follow. Yes. Um, so it's it's easier for me and more beneficial for me to view Jesus as that kind of person and leader than it is to think of Jesus as the victorious ruling king. There are times when I need Jesus to be the king. Absolutely. And there are times when I pray to Jesus as the king and say, you know, res rescue me. And we need a better king. Yes, and yeah. we need a better king. I think it's okay for us to experience Jesus in a number of different ways. And, and, and the way may change as your life changes. Absolutely. I, I never, you know, I didn't see Jesus the way that I do now when I was 30. Now that I've come out and now that I'm uh, a single man in my 50s and I'm, I, I experience God, I experience Jesus in a completely different, mm -hmm. richer, more nuanced way. Mm -hmm. There's not a simple definition or a simple right. way to characterize who Jesus is to me. Right. And so I would invite everybody to really explore that and really use your imagination and really choose to see Jesus and choose to experience Jesus' life as we read it in the Gospels as something that's living and vibrant and yes. growing and yes. deepening and yes. changing. Don't accept it as a flat list of things that you're supposed to believe right. 
or as a single decision that you invite yeah. Jesus into your heart and then you're done. I think patterning our lives after Jesus is what makes our life rich. It's what allows us to live in God's kingdom in yes. now, the yes. eternal now. Yes. Uh, and there's such a beauty and a, there's such life in that. Yes. As we talk about these things, and I know they're kind of deep, and I know they're kind of head scratching, and and they may they may hit you a way that you don't like. You may hear something, and you're like, "But wait, 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 no, 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 no." I, I would encourage you to just think of think about how you experience Jesus, how you serve God, what that means to serve God, and these terms that we throw around like King and Lord and Master. What do those mean for you? And I would challenge that. Neither Jesus nor God is is a cruel taskmaster that's mm-hmm. asking you to adhere to a list of rules or you're out of the club. Uh, that is not what a Christian life is. Amen, brother. You mentioned the various languages we use, the various ways we see God and Jesus, and how your view has changed over time. One of the practices, I think, that is incredibly important is to notice if our sense of God is too specific Mm. and then work at gaining the others. For example, we have both known people whose sense of God was the one you serve, your boss, if you will. Right. Nothing wrong with that. However, most of us don't have a warm and fuzzy relationship with our boss or with the person we serve. And so in that case, Removing ourselves from that understanding and practicing a different understanding enriches our relationship. Of course, yeah, right? absolutely. And it doesn't mean the boss, the, the, the master, that kind of master isn't also true. Mm-hmm. But, but we have to understand that Jesus is so much bigger, yeah. so much more dimensional. Um, that Yeah, no, I, I think that's incredibly important. I'm glad you brought that up. So for our progressive friends, I hope <laughs> we helped you. For our uh, ex-evangelicals and folks that are grappling with a more traditional, fundamental kind of reading of Jesus' life, I hope that we gave you some stuff to think about and to engage your imaginations. We talk about this stuff all the time, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to talk about it and let you in on the conversation. Yes. We invite questions yes. and comments. We invite ideas for other things for us to talk about. Yes. We uh, have regular stuff that we do. If you visit our website or our Facebook page, it's School for Seekers. You can find out more about what we do and uh, engage with us in other ways. Absolutely. Can we move on to the royal diadem at some point? Because <laughs> I, I was that... hoping you'd bring that up. <laughs> I think that's my next, my next challenge is to talk about the royal diadem. <laughs> Sounds like a navel piercing or something. Goth band. 